This is the Gray Man of Hatteras, a benevolent specter sometimes said to be the spirit of a man who died during a sudden flood which swept that stretch of the coast. Ever since this untimely demise, he has appeared countless times to help. Author and Outer Banks resident Charles Harry Whidbey called the Gray Man just as dependable as a barometer. He loves his people and wants to protect them from harm. One notable Gray Man sighting took place in 1966 during rough seas brought by Hurricane Faith. As per protocol, the Cape Hatteras Coast Guard was patrolling the beach, warning people of the incoming storm. And four days before Labor Day, apprentice Seaman Brooks and his detachment were finishing their rounds along Cape Point's beach when the men spotted, standing in the dunes, an old man swinging his arms wildly. It looked as if he were encouraging them to take cover or offering them fish sticks. I mean, we all know we can trust the Gorton's fishermen. All of the detachment save one were islanders and knew exactly who they were seeing, the gray man of Hatteras. The mainlander, on the other hand, ran towards the figure shouting warnings for him to get off the beach. When he got within 10 feet, the gray man turned, looked him in the eye, and simply vanished. He left behind no trace, not even footprints. The rest of the patrol explained to their enthusiastic co-worker what had just transpired. A little further down the beach on Hatteras, down by the Cape itself, dwells yet another mystery. A little white cloud is said to often hover above the waters, always in the same place, regardless of the weather. Supposedly, it is only absent during storms or heavy cloud coverage when it blends in with the rest of the sky. Otherwise, it simply hovers happily in the ocean breeze. The conventional explanation, but not the fun one, holds that heavy condensation generated by two strong ocean currents, which collide at the tip of the island, produce the little cloud. Local legends tell a different story. But that's not where the mysterious legends end for North Carolina. For you see, it gets much weirder. For example, Croatoan. Have you ever heard that word? It is the only solidly that we have in one of the earliest American mysteries. In fact, the first disappearance of settlers in the New World. Just off the mainland of North Carolina, the Roanoke colony vanished without a trace in 1590, and today it is known as the Lost Colony. It is only one of hundreds of mysteries surrounding the North Carolina coast and the Outer Banks. In fact, many people associate a life by the ocean with a carefree, give-and-take lifestyle. I mean, while it's true that daydreams of becoming a beach bum tempt many of us, we often overlook the sacrifices involved. I mean, oceanfront property brings with it privacy issues, and don't forget the constant influx of obnoxious tourists and yuppies. These, however, are small prices to pay compared to the effect of the environment on personal possessions. I mean, even the very air takes its toll. Salt water, constantly thrown up as sea spray, corrodes metal five times faster than fresh water. I mean, this puts anything outside made of metal at constant risk, including your car, from the body to the frame to the undercarriage. Thoughtful maintenance is a must. Then, of course, you have to deal with Mother Nature herself. Without any landmass or force to slow them down, you receive the full brunt of storms as they make landfall. Now, depending on where you are located, you might live half of each year under the threat of hurricanes, which in the past 42 years alone have caused more than $1 trillion in property damage and have been directly responsible for the deaths of around 7,000-ish people. I mean, even smaller storms bring with them the threat of flooding, which, at the very least, means that your insurance costs will be sky high compared to those living further inland. Long story short, a life at the beach isn't a day at the beach. It can be dangerous. 
and few beach dwellers grasp this truth better than the people of the Outer Banks. Now, this popular tourist destination is a chain of barrier islands. They are primarily located along the North Carolina coast, precariously situated between the ocean to the east and vast sounds to the west. The Outer Banks are exceptionally fragile. Some of the narrowest parts have only 150 yards separating the sound from the ocean. Each successive hurricane threatens to obliterate them entirely. And over the past 20 years, areas of the Outer Banks have lost over 200 feet due to erosion and currently see a loss of around 13 feet each year. Now, time and weather will destroy them. It is only a matter of time. And thankfully, they avoided at least one disaster. The Outer Banks does not have a Sabaro. With such adversities facing the region, it is unsurprising that the Outer Banks provided fertile ground for all variety of myths and legends. I mean, even the waters around them were notoriously dangerous. Robbers on shore deliberately set up lights imitating those of ships, hoping to force captains to run around, spilling their valuable cargo across the beach. Off the coast of Cape Hatteras sit the Diamond Shoals, an ever-shifting pattern of sandbars that have sunk so many ships, the area has earned the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Simply put, people on the Outer Banks were well aware of the fragility of life, meaning that death and the paranormal were just around every corner. Mysteries popped up as soon as settlers made landfall. In fact, one of America's oldest mysteries unfolded here on these isolated isles. The story of the lost colony, mentioned earlier, took place on Roanoke Island, which lies between the Outer Banks and the mainland. Although many compelling theories have been proposed over the years, exactly what happened to those 115 missing colonists remains inconclusive. Roanoke Colony marked the first attempt at a permanent English settlement in North America. It may have been cursed from the start. Governor Ralph Lane originally established it in 1585 on Roanoke Island in modern Dare County, only to suffer various setbacks, like the colony had a tense relationship with the indigenous population and was drastically undersupplied. In June of 1586, the colonists made contact with the passing fleet of British war hero and privateer Sir Francis Drake, who left them with four months of supplies and one of his ships. All were lost to a hurricane, however, and the colony was in a bind. A relief fleet with an entire year's worth of supplies was due soon, but that didn't help anyone in the short term. Eventually, the decision was made to evacuate the island, with nearly everyone, including Lane, returning with Drake to England. Only three people were left behind to greet the incoming fleet. They should have just held out a little longer. A single emergency supply ship sent by Sir Walter Raleigh arrived days after Drake helped with the evacuation. No sign of the three colonists could be found, and two weeks later, the relief fleet by Sir Richard Grenville arrived with supplies and 400 men, but they too found no one on those sandy shores. Now, Grenville returned to England, leaving behind a 15-man detachment to guard Sir Walter Raleigh's claim, and they too fell upon misfortune, because according to indigenous informants interrogated later, they were attacked by an alliance of hostile tribes, who killed two of them. Now, the remaining Englishmen piled into a boat to escape and were never heard from again. Now, rumor has it that the weather started getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed, but some speculate that they sat down on the shore of an uncharted desert isle where they had no phone, no lights, no motor car, not a single luxury. Despite these ominous setbacks, the English were determined to establish a foothold on the eastern coast of North America. And while we're on the topic of the East Coast, something that strikes me as very interesting is that there have been a multitude of reports about people not only seeing strange things around this area in the deep woods, but hearing things. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about Bigfoot or Dogman, I'm talking about things more on the paranormal spectrum. 
For example, it's been noted several times that people will hear what they describe as Native Americans chanting as if about to enter into a great war. Perfect example is back in 2011, David and Vanessa, who had been together for well over 10 years at that point, had both loved nature and the outdoors, and they were looking forward to getting away for the weekend and traveling around the Madame Mesquite Wildlife Refuge for a time. But on their drive near the refuge, they both stopped the car because they had heard what sounded like chanting from a distance. Now, this chanting was so out of place, they actually stopped the car, rolled down the windows, and began to listen intently. They were right. It was definitely chanting, but they couldn't be sure of its origin. They both felt a chill as they stepped into a realm of spirits, so to speak. David and Vanessa believed that they had heard the legends of the Native Americans and their spiritual presence in the area, but couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at being so close to such an ancient culture. They were both shaken by what they had heard because the chanting and screaming like they had heard sounded like there was a war about to erupt. This is not the first time people have reported strange sounds and screams right around this area. It seems that when you go into a place with a lot of history, good or bad, there always seems to be an energy that encapsulates it, as if constantly reliving the past, no matter light or dark. In 1587, a second, more successful attempt at the Roanoke Colony was made by a John White at the behest of Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, 115 people, including women and children, accompanied the migration. On July 22nd, the flagship of the three-vessel fleet anchored about 40 miles south of Croatoan Island, known today as Hatteras Island. Upon reaching Roanoke Island, John White found no sign of Grenville's 15 men. The fort was in shambles, the houses empty and overgrown. The only sign that anyone had been there were some bones that White discovered, presumably the remains of one of the victims. Now, three days later, the entire group of colonists disembarked, reclaiming the structures as best they could to start their new lives. Difficulties with the indigenous population restarted at once. And shortly thereafter, one of the island's inhabitants killed a man foraging for crabs by the waterside. Now, White was able to negotiate a truce with the local Croatan tribe, aided by Manteo, a member of the tribe who had been friendly to previous colonists, even traveling to England on several occasions. Manteo told White that most of the violence had been perpetuated by a coalition of tribes from the mainland, led by the ruler Wanchesi. The colonists attempted a peace deal using the Croatan tribe as an intermediary, but were met with silence. Now, fearing for the safety of his people, John White led a preemptive strike against one of the enemy villages, but unknown to them, Wanchesi had already withdrawn his own people. Instead, the colonists ended up killing their own allies and their Croatan who were in the process of looting the settlement. Now, relations were strained between the English and both tribes. Thankfully for them, Manteo smoothed things over. I mean, boy, wouldn't you have loved to be a fly on the wall for that conversation? There was a glimmer of hope amidst all this fighting. For you see, on August 18, 1587, Virginia Dare was born, widely regarded as the first European born in the New World. Her last name was later given to the North Carolina County, where Roanoke Island sits. Now, despite this positive development, the colonists determined that they would be better served moved 50 miles north. They wanted White to return to England and bring back a shipment of supplies for this venture. White agreed, and little did he know that this was the last he would ever see of anyone in Roanoke Colony. White's quick trip to England was delayed, although he arrived on November 5th after a difficult journey. He found his country in turmoil, at war with Spain. Reports indicated that the Spanish Armada was mobilizing for attack, and Queen Elizabeth had decreed that no vessel should leave London as every ship would be needed to participate in the impending battle. After many appeals, White was allowed to return, and Sir Richard Grenville involved in the Roanoke Colony saga earlier 
obtained a waiver to attack the Spanish in the Caribbean, or Caribbean, however you want to say it, and White was permitted to accompany him in March of 1588. However, unfavorable conditions kept the fleet in England, where new orders were handed down instructing Grenville to remain available for combat at the home front. Luckily, White was permitted to take two of the ships, one less fit for combat, back to America on April 22nd. The misfortunes refused to let up, however. The captains kept trying to capture Spanish ships to beef up their payday. Now, following these delays, around 24 members of the crew were attacked and killed by French pirates near Morocco, forcing the two ships to return to England. Finally, the Spanish Armada was defeated in August of 1588. However, the Queen's travel ban remained in place to prepare for a counterattack. John White would not be allowed to return to Roanoke Colony until 1590, two years after he had promised to return with supplies. The colonists learned a valuable lesson. There are two things you should never wait for, John White and the next George R. R. Martin book. That summer, White secured permission to travel aboard a privateering expedition into the Caribbean. Two of the six ships were permitted to break off from the fleet to take White back to Roanoke. On August 12th, the Hopewell and the Moonlight reached Croatoan Island. Three days later, smoke was sighted both from the north and south ends of Roanoke. Tides, weather, and some of which claimed the lives of crew members prevented a successful crossing of Pamlico Sound until the night of August 17th. Now, although the crew had seen more smoke, no one wanted to venture into the woods after dark. Instead, the rescuers overnighted just offshore in their boats, loudly singing songs in English in the hope that their voices would reach the stranded colonist. Now, the following morning, John White and his companions finally set foot once more on Roanoke Island. It would not prove to be a happy homecoming. Fresh footprints were found in the sandy soil, but their calls to the owners were answered only with the incessant buzzing of insects. None of the colony's boats could be seen on the shoreline. The houses were not only abandoned, they were fully dismantled. Any items that could have been carried had been removed. A handful of large trunks, including three buried by White, had all been exhumed and looted. But the most confounding details of all could be found in two locations. The first was a tree into which someone had carved the letters C-R-O. The second was a palisade erected to fortify the settlement in the time since White had left. On one of the posts was carved the name Croatoan. White had left the colonist with instructions. Before leaving Roanoke Island to resettle elsewhere, they were to leave behind what they referred to as a secret token, indicating their destination. In the event that they were forced out of the colony, the survivors were told to leave behind a different pattern, one signifying duress. This led White to believe that his people had fled under peaceful circumstances to the south towards Croatoan Island. White wanted to follow up on this lead immediately. However, in the meantime, one of the Hopewell's anchor cables had broken, leaving the ship vulnerable to wrecking should a storm arise. Now, the search efforts were called off, although White was granted a compromise. He planned to winter with the Hopewell in the Caribbean and return to investigate Croatoan Island in spring of 1591. Like so many other attempts to investigate, this, too, met with failure. After embarking on her journey to the Caribbean, the Hopewell was blown off course, forcing a supply stop in the Azores. Weather prevented landfall there as well, so the ship returned to England on October 24, 1590. Now, in the years since, Roanoke Colony, or the Lost Colony as it became known, has perplexed historians and the public alike. While at first, the possibility of relocation seems likely. I mean, no survivors were ever found, and some think that they were wiped out by the indigenous population. But if so, why did they carve a location and not their duress signal? Would they have even had time to carve anything at all if they were being attacked? The most popular theory holds that the colonists integrated with the friendlier tribes. 
In fact, today's Roanoke Hatteras tribe claims that their lineage includes both the native Croatan tribe and the lost colonists themselves. Other ideas include a Spanish attack, a failed return trip to England, a deliberate attempt by Sir Walter Raleigh's rivals to maroon the colonists, or that the colonists simply wandered into the wilderness where they perished. It has also been claimed that another tree to the south on Hatteras Island bore the inscription Cora, or C-O-R-A, suggesting another final destination. Somewhere on the mainland near Lake Matamasquit, where the small core tribe dwelled. Perhaps the colonist left a trail of breadcrumbs for John White to follow, a trail now lost to time. In any case, a definitive answer still eludes us. We may never know what truly happened to the lost colony, but equally confounding mysteries abound all across the Outer Banks and the coast of North Carolina. Now, about an hour and 20 minutes drive from Roanoke Island sits Hatteras Island, one of the most famous destinations in the Outer Banks. It is home to the most iconic of the Outer Banks, five lighthouses, the famous Cape Hatteras Light, which in 1999 was famously relocated 2,900 feet further inland from the eroding coastline. Before GPS, lighthouses fulfilled an invaluable role in maritime safety. Since the early 1800s, however, another protector has guarded the shores of Hatteras. It is said that during hurricanes, an old man wearing a Suester hat appears somewhere between the lighthouse and Cape Point, beckoning anyone caught in the storm to seek shelter. Now, apparently... Some time before the Revolutionary War, a schooner named St. Francis ran around in the Diamond Shoals, killing everyone aboard except a young Spanish seaman. He was rescued by a young Indian princess named White Cloud, who nursed him back to health. Over the course of his recovery, the two fell in love, and much to their surprise, her father, the chief, consented to the Union. However, the Spaniard wished to return home, if only briefly, to collect an inheritance that was waiting for him. He promised that he would return to his love as a rich man. With that, the Spaniard sailed away, never to be heard from again. Yet, over the days, weeks, months, and years that followed, his bride-to-be never lost faith, instead standing at the Cape looking across the ocean for her long-lost lover. At last, White Cloud lay upon her deathbed. When asked if there was anything she would like, she replied that her only wish was to spend eternity waiting for the Spaniard's return. And there, it is said, she lingers yet above the turbulent tides off Cape Hatteras as a lonely little White Cloud. It seems that this whole area is no stranger to the bizarre and unexplained. For an anonymous fisherman had submitted their account while fishing near the Pamlico River, they experienced something they could not explain that terrified them. I was fishing at the Pamlico River. I was by myself and had been there for a while. The fish weren't biting and I was getting bored. I decided to try a new spot. I was in the boat and moved to a new area. I was sitting on the edge of the boat, facing the river, when I saw something to my right. I thought it was a person by a tree, but it was too tall to be a person. It was almost as tall as the tree it was standing next to. I'm not sure if it's height, but I would guess 7 to 8 feet tall. It was very broad-shouldered and grayish in color. It looked like it was trying to hide behind the tree. I stared at it for a few seconds, not sure what to do, and it stared back at me. I started the boat, looking back to see if it was still there. It was gone. I thought I had imagined it, or it was maybe just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued to fish, but kept watching the shoreline. And I had this sinking feeling that something wasn't right, that something was watching me. I decided to call it a day and start heading back to the docks. Once I was halfway, something hit the boat. I thought it was a branch or something. So I looked over the side and, and could see it was not a branch. I don't know what it was, but it was long and slender and appeared to be rapidly moving towards my boat. Now This frightened me. I started the motor and got out of there. I locked the doors and sat in the back of my trunk once I got back to shore. I don't know what it was, but it scared me. 
I'm not sure if it was a big dog or a wolf or something staring at me through the trees. All I know is that it wasn't a dog because it was too tall and had really long arms. I don't know what it was. I'm not a big guy, but I'm no coward. I've been in a lot of scrapes and have been in some pretty bad bar fights. I'm not afraid to admit when I'm scared and I'm pretty scared right now typing this up. I'm not sure if I should tell anybody or report it to authorities. I'm not a crackpot looking for attention and I'm not trying to make any money off this. If there is truly something out there, then maybe somebody should know. I'm not sure what I saw, but I know it wasn't a dog. The port town of Edenton in Chowan County nonetheless serves a vital function in the survival of the northern Outer Banks. It is one of the closer big cities within reasonable distance. I mean, this is a relative term. Edenton only has around 4,500 residents. But in the early 1700s, accusations of witchcraft began flying in Chowan County. One of the most famous witch stories of eastern North Carolina occurred at Brown Rig Mill, just a dozen miles north of Edenton. The mill, erected in 1762 along Indian Creek, remained in use for nearly 200 years, offering the community a steady supply of high-quality white meal. At its peak, it also included a cotton gin and a sawmill. Following the American Revolution, the mill fell into the hands of Tim Farrow, a young widower. Tim's wife had left behind a very young daughter to care for, and between raising her and operating the mill, he had his hands full. Now, eventually, however, she grew up, allowing Tim to refocus his efforts on keeping the business running. In addition to working the mill, he was also a skilled woodsman, laboring tirelessly with his double-headed axe kept in the mill above the corn when not in use. Each day after work, Tim would spend an hour or two fishing in the water alongside the mill's dam. It was half hobby, half grocery shopping. Often as not, his efforts landed on the dinner table. On one of these midsummer evenings, Tim set up fishing as he usually did. As afternoon turned to dusk, he began packing his tackle, only to notice a canoe gliding towards his position. Now, given the way the occupant was dressed, Tim first looked her to be an old lady. But to his surprise, it turned to be a ravishingly beautiful woman. Beautiful green eyes, pink cheeks, flowing locks of jet black hair. For Tim, it was love at first sight. The mysterious stranger asked him for food and lodging for the night. A request which Tim did not find suspicious as he had spotted other travelers on the waterway from time to time. Now he obliged and the following morning the woman, we'll call her Tiffany, moved to a vacant room in a widow's home a few miles away before planning to continue on with her journey. But Tim, oh Tim, he could not help himself. The day before Tiffany's scheduled departure, he paid her a visit to confess his sudden love. He was received warmly, and she stayed in the community until a traveling preacher from Edenton came by shortly thereafter. He actually wed Tim and Tiffany, and soon they were living the quintessential domestic lifestyle. To make things even better, Tim's new wife and his daughter, they already had a kid already? Wow. They got along swimmingly. They would often sit by the fireside listening to Tiffany tell the most fantastic tales, stories of ancient Egypt and the Middle East, relayed with such enthusiasm and accuracy, it was almost like she had seen such things herself. However, small towns are susceptible to gossip, and Edenton was no exception. Word began spreading that the marriage was somehow scandalous, and soon enough, Everybody was repeating rumors as fact, and that is when a pattern began to emerge. The families whose members had most vocally criticized the woman had began experiencing a litany of troubles. Livestock fell ill and died for no apparent reason. The gossipers themselves followed shortly thereafter. Sabara was erected. Local doctors were perplexed by these undiagnosable ailments. I'm just joking about the Sabaro thing. The gossipers knew something was going on, though. Tim Farrow had married a witch. Yeah, get in line, buddy. Some said that they saw a cow keel over and die after Tiffany passed its pasture. 
Others claim that a grandmother of one of the families lingered in bed for days, completely delirious and speaking an unknown language. Hmm. When she finally recovered, she mumbled something about a strange lady who had worn the same clothing as Tiffany. The witch had stopped in front of her house, staring at the front door while she adjusted her bonnet shortly before the grandmother fell ill. Now, further testimony emerged. The widow whom Tiffany had stayed with said that during her brief time in her house, she had gone to make Tiffany's bed on several occasions, only to find it completely unslept in. The only noticeable disturbance was a large circular depression in the center almost like a giant cat would make it if it had slept on the top sheet. Although the scorn was aimed at Tiffany, Tim was the one who took it the hardest. Workers came to the mill complaining and threatening to take their business elsewhere, unless his wife ditches and bails out of town now. Things then began to go wrong at Brown Rig Mill. Neatly stacked sacks of grain would be found torn open and spilled each morning. The sluice gates and the dam would be open, even when Tim remembered shutting them. Nails appeared in machinery, bringing work to a loud grinding halt and lowering the quality of the meal. Tongs and other tools would be found misplaced and scattered. Now, Tim suspected he was the victim of harassment. Things only worsened when Tiffany became distant. He was now becoming ghosted and friend-zoned. Yikes. He was now sure she had grown tired and bored of life at the mill. She wanted fun. She wanted a bad boy. To catch the vandals, Tim stayed awake all night for a week. No one arrived and no damage was done, but Tim could not explain how his neighbors could have known that he was lying in wait for them. He was perplexed. Now, three days after abandoning this watch, Tim resolved to try and catch the vandals one last time. He told Tiffany that he was going to the store and would not return until late in the evening. In reality, he hid in the mill behind some meal sacks, waiting patiently as a massive thunderstorm rolled in overhead. It was frightful, cowering through the storm, but eventually the tempest abated. His respite was short-lived, however. The moon had just emerged from the clouds when an owl hooted, whoo, whoo, frightening Tim out of his wits. He regained his composure and continued waiting, sure that the culprits would arrive any minute now. It was then that the frogs began croaking. While this was a common occurrence of the mill, Tim knew in his gut that he had never heard so many croaking so loudly in his life. The cacophony continued to crescendo, but it couldn't drown out the thought that had crept into his head. Frogs were associated with demons and witches. The next entry in the wildlife parade was a host of lightning bugs, which streamed into the mill. There were more fireflies than Tim had ever seen, and they illuminated the interior of the mill in an eerie half-light. All the while, the bellowing frogs continued, and the storm whipped up once again, unleashing a torrent that seemed capable of washing away the entire mill. Without warning, a series of rapid blows struck the front door of Brown Rig Mill. It sounded like hundreds of broomsticks banging against the wood in an incessant clatter, demanding to be let in. Now, the staccato beats accompanying the frogs accelerated into a continuous drum roll until at last the door gave way. Tim watched in horror as 50 or 60 black cats, bigger than any Tim had ever seen before, poured into the doorway. In one synchronized motion, they encircled the hapless Miller, pacing around him in a snarling, spitting ring. Every now and then, one would step out of line to take a swipe at him, leaving his clothes shredded and his body bleeding. These attacks became so violent that Tim feared he would bleed out. Looking around for something to defend himself, his eyes settled on the handle of his trusty axe, protruding from the shelf above. He snatched the weapon and immediately brought it down upon the largest of the cats, cleanly severing its right front paw and embedding the axe in the timber beneath. The cat wailed in pain and ran with a limp toward the open doorway, its feline compatriots following suit. Within moments, Tim was all alone in the mill. Chapter 2 In that moment, Tim knew that if he was going to escape, this was his chance. Tim shot out onto the pathway home as quickly as he could. He raced through the heavy rain, reaching the door of his cottage, and flung it open. 
He didn't bother to shut it and instead ran into the bedroom, his clothes soaking wet. There, on his bed, lay Tiffany amidst a sea of crimson. She glares at him as she cradled the bloody stump of her right arm in her left hand. In the flash of an eye, she transformed back into the massive black cat, bounding off the bed, onto the floor, and out the door. Tim's mind immediately flashed back to the mill. He had been so preoccupied with all the cats that he never thought about the effect this heavy storm would have on the dam. So he races back to the mill, hoping to reach the floodgates in time to open them. He, boys and girls, failed. Tim Farrow was hallway across the dam when it collapsed, taking it with him to his doom. Or so the story goes. Now you have to ask who told the last part of this tale. If Tim was dead and the witch escaped, there weren't any witnesses. The affair at Brown Rig Mill is probably just an old legend. However, there is an interesting postscript to the story. You see, the dam was repaired and the mill sold to another man. He owned it for several years before noticing a large black cat that had begun prowling his property. After getting a glimpse of it up close, he noticed that it was missing, can you imagine, its front right paw. Aware of the legend and wanting to avoid history repeating itself, the new miller supposedly loaded his old musket with all the silver he could find, mostly coins, took aim at the cat as it sunned itself on the dam. He cocked the hammer, pulled the trigger, scoring a direct hit. The cat wailed as it fled into the forest, never to be seen again. Now, the lower tip of the Outer Banks ends at Cape Lookout. Similar barrier islands continue on down the coast, separated from the mainland by sounds all the way to the South Carolina border. Here lies Wilmington, the largest city in southeastern North Carolina. And in 1895, President Grover Cleveland was traveling the East Coast when his train made a stop in Wilmington at Mako Station to take on additional water and wood. During their brief break, President Cleveland left his car to stretch his legs and walk the tracks a bit. While doing so, he noticed that something struck him as peculiar. The trainmen in this area carried not one, but two lit lanterns. I mean, certainly one would suffice. The president asked the locals at the station why such redundancy was necessary. They told him in no uncertain terms that it was to distinguish actual railroad workers from Joe Baldwin, whose spirit still haunted the rails. The interaction made such an impression on President Cleveland that he mentioned it in several speeches afterward. Joe Baldwin's light, otherwise known as the Mako light, is one of the most famous ghost lights in North Carolina, after the Brown Mountain Lights, of course. Its origin story is similar to other ghost light tales. Now, supposedly sometime after the Civil War, a train conductor named Joe Baldwin was taken out near Mako Station during an accident with a caboose and a runaway railway car. After noticing the stranded car, he had run to the rear of the train to signal the next locomotive coming up behind him, frantically waving his lantern. The warning was not seen, however, and the accident whick, decapitated Baldwin. After that, a mysterious light began appearing nightly along the Wilmington and Manchester Railroad, bobbing up and down about five feet above the train tracks. The apparition was typically white, although it was sometimes reported as green or red. Witnesses said that its notion resembled that of a person carrying a lantern. The Mako light was said to be the spirit of Joe Baldwin, searching for his missing head. Sightings typically concluded when the light faded away into the distance or shot off one side of the track. It is a tale we have heard time and time again, the headless conductor doomed to wander the earth. However, unlike many ghost light sightings, the Mako light has caused dozens of real world consequences. Trains were often delayed or stopped after seeing the light in the distance, thinking it might be a person on the road or another locomotive. In fact, debunkers wrote off the Mako light as refractions from car headlights on neighboring U.S. Route 74. Supposedly, one particular bend in the road would cause the illusion that there was a light above the railroad. This, of course, does not explain sightings prior to the rise of automobiles. 
but might sometimes explain sightings in more recent times. It does not, however, explain the harrowing encounter reported by a U.S. Army colonel and his detachment of soldiers from Fort Bragg, about two hours north. You see, in the 40s, a Colonel Thompson became so intrigued by rumors of the light that he decided to lead a band of his own men onto the tracks to determine what the cause might be once and for all. Colonel Thompson hand-selected his crew, all World War II veterans, unlikely to be spooked by any tomfoolery. They visited the railroad for three consecutive nights. Now, the first two evenings, Joe Baldwin must have stayed hidden. The third night, however, things got a little crazy, and they all got more than they bargained for. In the far distance, a single light swaying and swinging back and forth manifested above the tracks, its beams glinting off the rails. From all appearances, it looked as if somebody was walking towards them, carrying a lantern. Colonel Thompson leapt into action, deploying his men in a skirmish formation. He planned to encircle and entrap whoever was responsible. Slowly and cautiously, they advanced. And as they drew nearer, even the battle-hardened veterans felt a tinge of fear. Something about this light simply wasn't right. Continued. Then, all of a sudden, the light simply winked out of sight. Everybody was dumbfounded. They froze in their tracks as the suffocating darkness of the night fell upon them once more. Then, from the rear of the group, a voice, Look behind us, Colonel! said one of the men. Turning, the soldiers all saw the light in the distance to their rear. Only someone possessing superhuman speed and silence could have managed to douse the light and run around them, not even being seen or heard. Nor had they seen anyone waiting where the light was now, if an accomplice was involved. Now, it was as if one of two things had happened. Either the light had shut off, flown over them, and landed on the other side of them, or... It had somehow passed through their formation invisibly. Now, some distance down the track, the light simply proceeded down the line, bobbing lazily as it had moments before. According to the story, the soldiers went home the following day, every one of them mystified except for Colonel Thompson. He simply denied the evidence of his own eyes and instead insisted that a rational explanation for the Mako lights must exist. Sadly, we have no sightings of that light since 1977. That year, the railroad tracks were removed. Since then, the Mako light has failed to reappear, and we can only hope that Joe Baldwin found his head before the tracks were taken away. And more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Are the Mako lights truly something of the supernatural realm, or are they easily explained away? Is the legend behind the Witch of Eden Town something that's real, or simply folklore and legend? Is there something truly mysterious that happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? I'll let you be the judge. Be sure to let me know what you think down in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and give that like button a big ol' smack and make sure you hit that subscribe button for more content just like this one. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you guys in the very next video.